Good morning. morning. Well, we are once again richly blessed to be able to come together, to be here on the Lord's Day, to worship God. We're so thankful to be able to be here today with each one of you. To our members, it's good to see you. To our visitors, welcome. We're glad that you've come to worship with us today, and we invite you to come back and be with us any time that you may have the opportunity to do so. I did not get this into the announcements this morning, but I do want to announce to the congregation that I'm glad to uh, welcome on behalf of the congregation Chad, Rose, and Emily Brown to our family here at Pyburn Street. They have expressed a, uh, an intention to identify with the congregation here at Pyburn Street, and we welcome them, and we look forward to uh, working and worshiping with them hopefully for many years to come. So everyone, uh, as you have opportunity, uh, make them welcome and get to know uh, Chad, Rose, and Emily. Also on the board in the foyer, also on the bulletin board, uh, beside Tom's classroom over here across from the restrooms, there is a new schedule for those serving at Randolph Home. And this does go through the end of this year. And if you have an opportunity, take a look at that. And if there's any of those dates that uh, you're scheduled to go, that you're not able to, uh, to keep that appointment, please let me know and we can change that schedule up just a little bit. Uh, but that is there. And if anybody that is scheduled to go to the nursing home would like to have a copy of that schedule, let me know. And I'd be glad to get you a copy. Over the last several weeks, we've been considering these I am statements of Jesus that we find in the Gospel of John. This morning, we're going to conclude this series of lessons by looking at the last of these statements. As we see set forth there in John 15 and verse 1, where Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now, in the previous eight statements that we've looked at, We saw Jesus proclaiming things about himself, proclaiming that he is God, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Son of Man, that he is the promised Messiah. And these proclamations were made so that we could come to know more about Jesus, so we could know more about his nature, about his character. But in this last of these I Am statements, We find Jesus going in a little bit different direction in that in this statement he's not dealing so much with a characteristic of himself. But in this statement he is dealing with what he expects of us. Once we come to know him, once we understand these things about his nature, about his character, once we express a desire to be his disciple. What is expected of us then at that point? Well, he tells us that we are expected to produce fruit. To bear fruit. Or else, he says, we will be cut off and cast into the fire. So as we enter into this study this morning, I'd ask you to turn with me, if you haven't already, back to John 15. And our lesson text today is going to be the first eight verses of this chapter. Brother Jared shared those with us just a moment ago. But let's look at this once again to refresh our memories as we enter into our discussion this morning. Here Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me... Ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, 
You shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Jesus has assembled with his closest friends. These 12 men, 11 of those would form that core group along with Matthias, who would be the early leaders in the church. But they've come together just a few short hours before the arrest of Jesus. They've assembled in an upper room and they are observing the Passover feast. Well, after they have finished their supper, they're still there around the table and Jesus is speaking with them, telling them some things that they need to know about what is about to transpire. Now, he's already relayed to them the fact that he's about to depart. The fact that that it's about time for him to, to go to the cross to die. And he knew that they were upset about this fact. He knew that this was unsettling to them. They didn't like the idea of being separated from Jesus in this sense. And in order to extend a little bit of comfort and a little bit of encouragement to these men, Jesus offers this beautiful metaphor that we see in this statement today. I am the true vine. Jesus was wanting his friends, not just the eleven, but each and every person who would be a friend to Jesus from that point forward. He wanted each and every one to know that he's not going to desert us, that he's not going to leave us on our own, And even though he is not going to be with us in a fleshly form as he had been with these men for the previous three years, that we would still be connected to him. One writer put it this way, and I think this is a wonderful way of describing this. It says, his living energy, his spiritual reality would continue to nourish and sustain them just as the roots and the trunk of a grapevine produce the energy that nourishes and sustains its branches while they develop their fruit. So what Jesus is saying is, just because you cannot see me, it doesn't mean that I'm not there. Just because you cannot feel me, it doesn't mean that you are not connected to me. You see, they were sad that he was about to depart. But he wanted them to know, I'm never really going to be gone. I'm never really going to leave you. He says, just as that branch stays connected to the vine and receives that nourishment to sustain life, he says, you're going to stay connected to me. If you abide in me, you will stay connected to me and you will continue to receive nourishment from me through the relationship that you have with me. But he says this is only going to happen if you abide in me. Now Jesus went on to remove any misunderstanding about what he meant when we look at his statement there in verse 4. He said that no branch is able to survive by itself. But how many times do we see people in the world around us today who are trying to go it alone? Who are trying to make it through this life without the assistance of any person, without the assistance of God or Christ or their brothers and sisters in Christ. They think they can go it alone. Well, Jesus very plainly says, that's not going to work. He says, you cannot survive that way. You have to stay connected to the true vine. That's the only way that life is going to be sustained, that spiritual existence. Folks, if we find ourselves disconnected from Christ, then our spiritual life is going to decline very rapidly. Very rapidly. Because our source of spiritual existence, our source of spiritual life, And our ability to bear spiritual fruit is not within us. It is not something that is within our human capacity. It's outside of us. It's Christ. 
Christ is the one that provides us with that. He provides us with that life. He provides us with that spiritual health. He provides us with the energy that we need to bear fruit for Him. But if we want to do this, if we want to live right, if we want to serve Him and please Him, then we have to stay connected to Him in a faithful and loving relationship. If we don't have a relationship, a connection to Christ, then we are not really His disciple. Because you notice in our lesson text, He says, the fruit that you bear as a result of that connection to me, He said, that's how you are my disciple. He said, you're not my disciple just because you claim to be my disciple. You're my disciple because you have a relationship with me. And you're doing my will. Jesus then underscored this point even more strongly in verse 5. Notice he says, apart from me you can do nothing. And of course in this he's talking about from a spiritual standpoint. He says, without me, he says, you're not going to be able to bear fruit. You're not going to be able to produce any good things spiritually because no one can achieve anything of true spiritual value without Christ. It's not possible. We have to be connected to Him. But also He reminds us, He says, yes, He says, there are some who are in Me, but they're not bearing fruit. Now what He means by that is not that there are some true branches out there who just, you know, who just happen to not bear fruit. Now think about that for a moment. He said, there are not any, and let me, let me put this a different way. He said, there's not any Christians out there who just by chance aren't bearing any fruit. He said, if you are truly my disciple, if you are truly connected to the true vine, if you are truly a child of God, then you will be bearing fruit. All true branches bear fruit. Now how do we know that a tree or a plant is healthy? By the fruit that it bears. But also if we see a tree or we see a plant that is withered or it is not producing the fruit that it's not supposed to bring forth, why is that? Because something is wrong. It's not receiving the nourishment that it needs. It's not receiving the things that sustain that life. So it's not going to bear good fruit. Well, the same is true with us as children of God. But Jesus goes on to say, he says, those who are not bearing good fruit, which conversely, as we just noticed, would be those, maybe they believe that they're Christians, but they're not really. They believe that they're disciples of Christ, but they're not keeping his commandments. They're not living as they should. They're not maintaining that connection to Christ. He said, those who do not produce good fruit, he says, they're going to be cut down and burned. They're going to be cut away. And the reference here is those who profess to know Christ, who claim to be children of God, but whose relationship to Him is not sincere. You know, it's one thing to say we know Christ, that we love Christ, that we're a disciple of Christ, but it's another thing entirely to prove that. Well, how do we prove that? By the fruit that we bear. By the fruit that we bear, we prove that we're connected to that true vine, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus provides us with the things that we need in order to produce fruit for Him. But simply put, He says, those who are in Me, who claim to be Christians, who profess to be My followers, but are not bearing good fruit, Essentially, he's saying, folks, he said, these are not ones that I've called into the kingdom. These are not ones that I've saved. These are not ones that I'm sustaining spiritually. He says, they're withered away. They're going to be cut away. And he says, eventually, he says, they're going to be identified as unfruitless. They're going to be identified as not belonging to the vine or not I said unfruitless, unfruitful. 
Meaning they're not connected to this true vine. They're not living life the way that they should. And so he says they're going to be cut away lest they take away any benefit from those who are connected to the true vine. Those of you who plant gardens, why do you go through your garden and tear out all the weeds? Why do you go through and remove the thorns and the thistles? Why do you go through and remove those plants that have died? Because you don't want them taking any nourishment away from those good, fruitful plants. Jesus said in verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Or some translations say the vine dresser. The one that maintains the vineyard. And if our ultimate goal, folks, is to grow and to learn and discover things about ourselves and about God, then living a life of ease is probably not going to get us to that point. Here's something I want you to think about for just a moment. And this is something that I had not really considered all that much until I started looking at this lesson. But if you reflect back upon your life, when did your faith grow the most? When did your appreciation for God, for Christ, for the church, for your brethren, when did it deepen the most? Probably not when things were going good. Probably not when we felt like we had everything under control. But more than likely, it was in those times where we were driven to our knees in dependence upon God. Those times when we became so beat down that we realized, I, I can't do this on my own. I can't go on any further. So many times today people have this mentality that if our God is truly such a good and loving God, then why do His people suffer? Why do they face these difficult times? Well, it's because no one ever really learned anything about God during times of ease. No one ever moved back or moved forward in their faith from that position of, yes, we believe in God until we reach that point where we realize we are dependent upon God. Our faith grows. Our understanding deepens. Our devotion to God grows exponentially when we face those difficult times in life. Oh, yes, we can know about God's love. We can understand God's love. We can even appreciate God's love. But what does it mean to abide in God's love? That's the whole point of this section of Scripture. What does it mean to abide in God's love? Well, that's a different matter altogether, isn't it? Look at verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue or abide in my love. Now, by studying God's Word, we can learn about how our Heavenly Father loved His only begotten Son. Three times in the Gospel accounts, we find God declaring from heaven, This is my beloved Son. Time after time, we see this reference to God's beloved Son. Son, God fully loved His Son. Dare I say, even more so than any human father ever loved his child. But He still sent Him to the cross. Jesus still had to endure that. God fully loved His Son, but He allowed His Son to die on the cross. Now, it's not supposed to happen that way, is it? Or at least that's what we're told. It's not supposed to happen that way. Parents are not supposed to watch their children die. It's what we're told. And I do not know of a single parent who would not lay down their life so that their child could live on. 
But notice what Jesus says. He says, if you can understand the love between me and my Father, he said, then you can understand the love that I have for you. He says, the same degree of love that exists between him and God exists between him and us. Now, with that in mind, he says that if you truly love me, then you're going to abide in my love. Now this brings up another dimension to the love between God and Christ. Christ had to abide in God's love just as we have to abide in Christ's love. Let me describe this from a little bit different angle. I want you to think back to when you were a child. Some of you, you don't have to think back very far. Some of you have to think back quite a ways. But think back to when you were a child. What did it take for you to abide in your parents' love? Now, I'm sure that each and every one of us would say, well, I know my mom and dad loved me. I know that they loved me. And certainly, our parents loved us as children, and they continue to love us throughout life. Now, they may not always agree with the decisions that we make, They may not always like the the course of life that we choose to follow, but does that love ever really stop? No. That love is always there. And we know that. But there's a vast difference in me knowing that my mom and dad love me and in abiding in their love. So how do you abide in someone's love that's the question that we really need to understand this morning how do we abide in someone's love well verse 10 gives us the answer keep my commandments you know most people in the world around us today when they read that that is a painful statement we don't like having to submit to someone else. We don't like having to do what someone else wants us to do. But Jesus says that in order to abide in His love, we have to keep His commandments. But where the struggle arises is that there are so many people today that have never deepen their love has never deepened from the point of having just that cursory understanding, yes, God loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. To actually knowing what it takes to remain in that love. Now something to keep in mind. It's true, nothing can separate us from the love of God, just like nothing can separate us from the love of our parents. But love that is based simply upon relationship is much weaker than a love that is based upon faithfulness. You remember when you were a child and you did something wrong? There are a lot of good people in this building today. But I'm sure that every one of us as a child had times where we did things that we weren't supposed to do. What happened? We had to face the consequences of our actions. Now sometimes those consequences could range from spanking to grounding to uh, losing responsibility or losing, um, losing certain freedoms that we had, loss of privileges, or maybe your parents had some other form of punishment that they would use that was effective in that household. But nevertheless, why did we receive that punishment? It wasn't because we had lost the love of our parents, but it was because we had failed to abide in their love. We were punished because we did not keep their commandments. Well, let's look at the flip side for just a moment. What about when you did something good? We like to be complimented, don't we? We like to be told that we've done something good, but you think back. Whose compliments in life have meant the most to you? Your parents. 
your parents. Yes, the compliments of a spouse are important. The compliments of our peers are important. But you think back to when you were a child and you think about how much joy it brought to your heart when your mom or dad said that they were proud of you, that you had done a good job. Why did you feel that way? Because you had abided in their love. And they showed that love to you in that way. Jesus said there in verse 10, He says, If you keep My commandments, you shall abide in My love, even as I have kept My Father's commandments and abide in His love. So how did Jesus abide in God's commandments? Because He kept God's commandments. He did what was expected of Him. And as a result of that, He was able to maintain that relationship with His Father. So how do we maintain a relationship with Christ? How do we stay connected to the true vine? We keep His commandments. We live a faithful Christian life. Jesus was willing to do everything that His Father told Him to do, even though some of it was not pleasant, even though some of it brought about intense pain and agony. He knew that that was His Father's will. He knew that that was what He had to do in order to remain in His Father's love. He was willing to do it. And this is what led to God saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, what is it going to take for you and I to be able to stand before Jesus on the day of judgment and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. We're going to have to abide in His love. And if we abide in His love, we will remain connected to that true vine. We will receive that nourishment, that encouragement that we need in order to continue on in this life. To continue to faithfully serve Him. Because if you remember there in verse 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you cannot accomplish anything of a spiritual nature. Folks, there's nothing that we can do if we're not attached to that true vine. Now, how do we get connected to that vine? I shared the story with you. It's probably been a year or so back now. I believe it was on a Wednesday night of the time when my brother and I were children. Um we decided we were going to try to graft a couple of trees. Well, we went out in the woods and we cut down a couple little saplings about as big around as your thumb, and we couldn't find any kind of tape or anything, so we went in the house, we found some scotch tape. We went out there and we stuck those two things together and we wrapped it up. It was about the ugliest thing you'd ever seen in your life. And for some reason it didn't grow. It died. We had to pull it up because it had not been grafted in the proper fashion. So how do we become connected to the true vine? Well, we do that by obeying the gospel of Christ. When we become a child of God by obeying Jesus' directives as set forth in the Scriptures, He will connect us to Himself. When we place our faith in Him and we turn away from the world in repentance... We come forward and before a group of brothers and sisters in Christ, we confess that faith we have in Christ. We submit ourselves then to the waters of baptism. Those sins are washed away. We come forth out of those waters attached to that true vine. As we sang in that beautiful song, Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Stay connected to him. And you will bear fruit for Him. Stay connected to Him. Abide in His love. And you will live a fruitful Christian life. And simply put, what we see Jesus saying in this statement, I want to paraphrase this just briefly. Jesus says, I want you to abide in my love. I want you to stay connected to me. I want you to keep my commandments. I want you to love my church Maintain my closeness and my communication. Fulfill my commission. Do what I ask of you. And I will say, child, well done. Is that what we're doing today? 
Ask yourself this question. Are you connected to the true vine? Are you abiding in the love of Christ today? Well, if so, Jesus tells us in this passage, if so, you will come to find an abundance of joy in your life. But if you're not, He says you will be cut down. You will be cast away. Your soul will be lost for eternity. And I leave you with these words. John 15 and verse 5, I am the vine... Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Folks, if you are not connected to the true vine today, get that way. If you are not abiding in the love of Christ today, get that way. Because the only way that you're going to be able to please God the only way that you're going to be able to bear precious fruit for Jesus today is if you are connected to that true vine, if you are abiding in the love of Christ. If you've never been connected to that true vine because you've never obeyed the gospel, all things are prepared today to assist you in doing that. Place your faith in Christ. Repent of your sins. Come forward and confess that faith and be baptized. Or if you've not been abiding in the love of Christ because you've allowed sin to come into your life and to pull you away from God, to separate you from that true vine, the good news is you can be grafted back in again. Repent of your sins. Rededicate your life to Christ. Be restored to the faith. This morning, if you examine yourself, and you need to respond to the invitation of Christ, then we encourage you to come forward at this time while together we stand and sing.